We are not alone. And welcome everyone to the debut of Contact TV. And yes, this is us. We are here. We are visual. We're in 3D or something like it. Perhaps 4D, not sure. But uh, we're very thrilled to be here with you this evening. And every two weeks we'll be putting up new shows, new content. And whether you're watching us on our YouTube channel, which most likely you are, or whether you're watching us on earthmysterynews.com, a fantastic new alternative news platform where we are also going to be uh, presenting our shows on a bi-monthly basis. We're thrilled that you joined us. And for our first show, it seems appropriate that we have one of our most favorite guests back to join us. And uh, certainly this gentleman appeared on Contact Radio several times. Mm -hmm. And I am talking about our friend Ahonu. And uh, Ahonu is an author, a spirit artist, a speaker, a consciousness researcher, uh, an alliance of divine love minister, a radio host himself, and a spiritual teacher who individually and also as a twin flame with his dear wife, Angel Rose, have helped countless people all over the world move from mediocrity into joy clarity and awareness through their simple but highly effective honest to god series of books programs workshops and online sessions ohano's recent book the reincarnation of columbus is his deeply personal recounting of a true epic voyage from the pain and sorrow of a father's grief to the new world of empowerment love and forgiveness and Ohanu's book, as well as his stunning spiritual art and his enlightening programs and workshops, are all accessible through www.ahonu.com. And in May of 2017, and this is very exciting, uh, Ahonu and Angel Rose are going to be guiding a journey to the ancient spiritual spots of Ireland. And mm. and. I'm on the list to go. I can hardly wait. You are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome. And thank you thank so you. much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Speaking of joy, it is a joy. It really is a joy to be here speaking with you and to be on the, your first YouTube session. It's absolutely marvelous and it's a great joy and I'm privileged and delighted to be here. And I hope I'll be able to contribute something to your wonderful session. Oh, absolutely. 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 And you know, one of the reasons that we did want to have you in particular on is that this show is going to be debuting on May 1st, which of course is the uh, sacred historic Irish holiday of Beltana, I believe it's pronounced. You can uh, correct me. Beltana? Beltani? Well, uh, I will. Let me correct you. And this is not a criticism by any means, but it is, a, 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 it is the way many Irish names were actually transposed or anglicized, we prefer to call it. Mm. The ori original and real name of that festival is actually Bealtaine, is what we call it, Bealtaine. But it's, it's easier, easier understood called Bel Beltane in the United States mm -hmm. and in Canada. But Bealtaine is the way we pronounce it. And the reason we do that is because the, the Beal part of it is actually a reference to Baal, B-A-A-L, from those ancient times, you see. Really? And the Tina bit of it is the Irish word for fire because it is a it is a fire festival yes oh. it is indeed and where the fire comes in is really interesting actually because that festival on the first of May it's like it's one of those cross quarter days where you are between the spring uh, the spring uh, um, equinox and the summer solstice. Mm -hmm. It's a cr cross quarter day and it was one of those days where the native people would bring their cows uh, up to the higher pastures in the, in the, the mountain slopes and, and that. Now, not that there's any big high mountains in Ireland, which is 3,400 feet or something, so it's not that high in comparison to bigger ranges throughout the world. But still, the fact is that uh, they would be able to let the cows out. Now, to protect those animals, they would form a, a, a festival of fire and they would actually arrange that they themselves and the, and the animals would jump through parts of the fire because the fire was cleansing. 
And that's where it actually got its name from. And it has been a practiced ritual and tradition for, you know, those thousands of years. And some parts of the country still practice it. But as I say, we know it as Bealtaine or Beltane, yeah. Bealtaine. So yes. it, in, in present time, Ireland, would it be celebrated more in the rural areas, more in the farming areas? It would, yeah. But having said that, though, there's something about a tradition that gets handed down in your DNA, do you know? So everybody recognizes it, but not everybody might go out and practice it in that traditional way, do you know? But there will be festivals going on, there will be celebrations going on, there will be fires held in various towns and rural areas all around the country. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing. And if you were there on holidays at this time, which you will be next May, now it depends, we may not, be, may not get there on the 1st of May, but it'll certainly be within the first 10 days of May we're planning. But you would witness this type of enthusiasm for those ancient traditions. You know? So they're still very alive, even though the people don't believe in the power of them the same as they used to do. Mm, I see, I see. But yeah. they're still right there ingrained in the DNA, and I'm sure there are some people in Dublin jumping through fires at various <laughs> various pubs. <laughs> yeah, various well, pubs. you know, it's like it's like the the it's like it's opposite. You know, in the time of Halloween, it's opposite cross quarter day, where that's all about fire. Also, the big bonfires. You know, it's a similar idea. Uh, but this one is, of course, in the 1st of May. But um, interestingly enough, there has been a resurgence of the, the enthusiasm for this kind of thing. And I'll give you a, a very quick story of our experience of this. There is a place called Ishnock in the very center of Ireland. If you, if you could imagine Ireland in your mind's eye and draw a, a cross right down the center and across the middle of the country, and right where those meet, it's like the geographical center of Ireland almost, there's a place called Ishnock, and that means in our Irish, it means, um, some people say it means the navel of Ireland. But in that place was the, originally the place where the high kings of Ireland all met and were crowned, up until they formed the fifth province of Tara. And everybody has heard of Tara from Gone with the Wind and all of that. But that became the fifth province, and then the crowning of the kings moved to Tara. But with regard to Ishnock, though, always there was the lighting of the fires there, every single Bealtaine, and at other times as well throughout the year. But in 2012, when Angel Rose and I were there, there was no fires, there was no talk of the fires. Mm. And, and we, there's a whole other story, and I'm not going to go there right now, but we ended up staying in a house that was at the foot of this hill, and right outside the window was the ancient royal road that led up to the top of this hill. And lo and behold, at that time, wasn't the owner of the land, which is now held in private ownership, was considering opening up the land again for the use of a fire festival. Oh. And he did it that year, and he called it the Festival of the Fires. And since then, that has become one amazing festival again, like as if that whole energy from way past was, there was a resurgence, there was a whole new enthusiasm, and they brought in musical bands and vendors, and it was absolutely wonderful, and that continues now to this day, and hopefully will continue, yeah. In fact, an interesting story about that too is, in order to make it licensed and, and uh, a part of the traditional Celtic calendar, they actually got on their horses and marched to Dublin to uh, to plead with the ministers in the uh -huh. parliament <laughs> that, that this would become yeah this would become oh, a part of the festival yeah, yeah. Oh, so, uh, the calendar yeah. Do you know I want to tell you something interesting uh, because I, I know you've things you want to cover but this is relevant to when you were talking about uh, Ireland and the language mm -hmm. the the language of Gaelic that the Irish speak and the, and the Scots and the Welsh is absolutely beautiful language and they say that it's actually connected with Sanskrit in some ways yes. that it's not it's nothing to do with Latin uh, or the Latin languages and it's very descriptive and very melodic and it's a beautiful language to listen to even if you didn't understand it you know when you hear it spoken it's very it's very melodious and the other thing when I mentioned about this place called Ishnock you know in the very center of Ireland that is also the burial place of 
an ancient Celtic queen by the name of Eru. And I don't know if you or your listeners or viewers would know, but the Irish name for Ireland is Era, and it's named after her. Oh. Yeah. So there's good female energy all there is. over the place. Oh, yeah. beautiful, beautiful. Divine feminine seeps through. Oh, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And speaking of this wonderful queen and some of the um, royal personages of ancient Ireland, are there individuals today who claim ancestry to say Brian Baru or some of the early kings of Ireland? Oh, absolutely, yes, yeah, absolutely. There are, uh, there is, um, oh, I've forgotten what you call it, um, um, coats of arms mm. that are handed down from ancient times. And ma there are many families who belong to those still to this day. And interestingly, they call them, like my last name, for example, is O'Grady. And it all means of. And uh, by contrast, people would be familiar with the Mac of Scotland. And the Mac means son of also, but it, you'd know that that's a Scottish name. But the Irish O'Grady, in my case, means son of. And the head of that clan is called the O'Grady. Oh. So, yeah. And there will be, there is, uh, and I think actually Dio Grady is living in Canada of all places right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, they visit, they go back and, and have the clan gatherings and all of that every year as usual. But um, the likes of Brian Baru, yes, because you have, uh, you will have the clan leaders who are co directly connected to them. Now, a lot of the records were lost and destroyed by various incursions mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and various control measures. Mm. But still, though, uh, a lot of it would have been handed down word of mouth and uh, those connections are still there to this day. And it's a wonderful thing, actually. But as I said, a lot of people, too, are beginning to let go of that old uh, way that it made them feel that there was some kind of defensiveness about it or some need to protect or control and that's shifting slowly to where it's been shared now do you know what I mean wonderful wonderful yeah. and um, Ahonu do you um, uh, in speaking about of course the uh, the ancient um, uh, Gaelic religions the Celtic religions and the pantheon of Irish gods of which Baal and Lu are a part do they correspond rather directly to the pantheons of the Norse, the Greek, the Native American, Canadian gods, or do they do they stand on their own? You know, I, I'm actually not the right one to answer that question. But what I can tell you, though, is I believe that they do have that correlation. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because when we were in California, we met a, a gentleman. Um, Oh, gosh, what was his name? Um, uh, Gerald Clark. And Gerald Clark wrote a book called The Seventh Planet, Mercury Rising, because he, he did a lot of research into the Anunnaki. Now, some people, the reason why I'm telling you this is because some people actually say that those ancient peoples of Ireland, like the Tuatha de Danann, yeah. Were descendant, were originated from the Anunnaki. That these were the gods of old. Mm -hmm. That they actually landed there in that part of Ireland. Now, uh, he has done a fantastic, fantastic research that actually correlated a lot of those ancient gods from one tradition and cultural to another. Yes. Now, he didn't connect them to the Irish gods and God, but I'm venturing to say that if he can connect the Greek and the Egyptian mm -hmm. and the Sumerian and all of those together, then certainly they're going to connect to the Irish as well. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think that goes without saying. And I, by the way, I do subscribe to that belief that the, that this, the, the Irish yeah. pantheon were in fact Anunnaki and that Ireland was a outpost or a colony, if you wish, of that early civilization. Some interesting things that have been discovered recently that, that point to uh, this uh, hypothesis. You know, um, O negative blood as a blood type is yes, uh, sure. now been, it's been determined. It is the oldest of the blood types. The other blood mm -hmm. types come in later with different infusions, possibly with other uh, culture bearers, who knows. But uh, Irish people have a 
predominant amount of O negative blood. The world population as a whole only has three and a half percent of people manifesting O negative blood when you look at the whole world. But in Ireland, it's up around 60 percent. So it's huge. <laughs> And, yes, uh, and when when you look at the red hair also, there's something about the, the red, because they did say, or somebody did say, perhaps it was Gerald Clark with his study of the Anunnaki or various others, that there was this red hair. And in fact, some of the Egyptian mummies that were found had red hair, and they were trying to figure out how was that possible. Indeed, indeed, Ohana, yeah. that's absolutely true. Now, the, mm. the only people that have more O-negative blood going than the, than the Irish are the Basque people who are also red-haired, by the way, and 93% uh -huh. of the Basque population has O-negative blood. So you know what, <laughs> you, you know what I found really interesting about that, and that was that um, I, I think it is, the, is the, the A's and the rhesus that has that monkey mm -hmm. blood connection to it, but one of them is copper. Uh, yes. And the other is iron. Yes. And I think it's the, the O-negative is... Um, copper-based. Yes, you're exactly, uh, am I right? I, you're exactly right, Ahonu, which yeah, is very interesting uh, because there was an awful lot of copper mining and copper infatuation all yeah. over the, uh, all, in all the Celtic islands and also in, um, um, in parts of North America, which we yes. are now seeing from some of the ancient ruins that correspond mm -hmm. architecturally, mm -hmm. uh, that there was a sophisticated um, megalith building and yes. mining of copper going on, yeah. like yes, crazy. Yes, yes. So yes, that, yeah. that definitely was the case. Yeah. The other thing too, when you talk about the Anunnaki, you know, we, we've come to recognize now that they were giants, they were very mm -hmm. large people. And there is a place in the north of Ireland called Giant's Causeway. Yes. It's quite a, a, a place that people visit because it was, I think it's recognized as uh, one of UNESCO's uh, preserved uh, what World did they call heritage it? Site. World Heritage yes. Site. Yes, and um, but there, there's a, there's a footprint there that is uh, I, I'm not sure what size it is, but it's probably <laughs> 18 inches. You know, it's, it's, it's like it's, three meters long. It's it's well, massive. Yeah, and the ancient stories of the mythological heroes of Ireland were supposedly able to step across the Giant's Causeway into Scotland. They were able to step across the 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 Irish Sea there. Yeah. That. Uh, I think it's only like 18 miles, but still, when you consider, somebody would have to be quite big to be able to walk across that. Indeed, you know? and yeah. and these 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 giant these giant individuals, you know, they show up, you know, all over the place. They, they yes, they do. They they've shown up not very. They've shown up, I believe, not not too far from you now. They've shown up in Catalina Island. There's been quite, quite That's a right. number of discoveries of red-headed, nine, ten, eleven foot tall. Um, uh, skeletons remains, um, and yes. in the in the mounds, the famous mound builders, the mounds that are all over the Midwest and the Southwest, there yes. allegedly are the burial spots. Uh, according to some recent information, the um, Smithsonian Institution, um, and this was a deathbed confession of a gentleman who was very high up in that organization, and they were mm. ordered uh, sometime in the 1950s to incinerate all the giant skeletons that had been oh, recovered. Oh dear. Yeah. Yes. Isn't that interesting yeah, now? Because it didn't fit in. Didn't fit yes, in yes, the yes, uh, yes. established yeah. timeline. And, and also in keeping oh. with that, um, you're probably also aware of this, but the most recent DNA studies of the mummy of Tutankhamun um, mm -hmm. have come out that he does he has European DNA. It's not <laughs> even Egyptian. So the Egyptian, uh, what is they called, the Ministry of Antiquities or whatever it is, they tried to suppress yeah. that information. They don't like that idea at all. They like their idea of the uh, 10 right. million Egyptian slaves in diapers rolling those blocks up on logs. Do you That's know what something? they're comfortable with. You know something, Leslie, I have to say this because it's something that is coming up more and more and more for us as time goes on. And that is the fact that you have got these professional adult men and women who believe stuff. And when, they, when it, they're challenged by something that is more credible or maybe even less credible, but they're not willing 
to open their minds to look at any other possibility other than what they've been led to believe. And I use that word quite strongly, led to believe, because that's what all the dogmas do. It's what all the, 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 the religions do. It's a, it's a dogma, it's a belief system that you daren't venture away from. You daren't look at the other possibilities. Now, as more and more of this evidence comes up, some people are beginning to open their minds and I regard those people as real pioneers. They're the ones who are willing to open their minds and see, oh my God, this, th there must be something to this. Yeah. You know, we can't shut it out anymore. Yeah. The evidence is becoming overwhelming. But you know, it's like the library at Alexandria, Alexandria when, when that was burnt down, you know, we, in, in a sense, we still feel the loss from that now, that there was this knowledge that was there that's no longer available to us. But, because Angel Rose and I go into the Akashic records all the time, that knowledge is actually in the ethers. It's everywhere. It's available to people. So as time goes on and the consciousness becomes more aware, we are beginning to find more and more discoveries that these so-called professionals can no longer ignore. Indeed. You know? Indeed. Well, there's, yeah. a, there's also the question of world views and things like that and comfort levels. And this yes. really bothers some people, and there's a question of pride, whether it's personal pride or national pride. It's yeah. really, it's, it's Sully's information. Yeah. Well, we are all interrelated. We, were, yes. we are all connected. We are connected right. genetically. We are connected spiritually. And I think one of the wonderful things that these new DNA services do, like 23andMe or Ancestry.com, is they give people that right brain proof that they're looking for. In fact, I myself, me, the whitest woman in the world, I have a cousin in Florida named Tanisha Skye, who is a big, beautiful African-American woman. So we are now? second cousins somehow there you go. We, we share but you look look doesn't barack obama claim irish ancestry through his mother's life yes, you know so i mean so does every other president of course of yeah. the united states but <laughs> i mean <laughs> the irish did get around of course <laughs> They're famous for it. That, uh -huh. that roving thing, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, I had a, a, and this is, might sound like a completely ludicrous um, um, uh, question, Hanu, so, so just humor me. If it, sure. um, I was, wanted to talk just a wee, wee bit about uh, High Brazil, uh, the very, wow. the famous, legendary, almost... Um, uh, um, what is the word? Very much like in the Arthurian legends. Yes. Uh, an, an island that is the home of the gods and can disappear and reappear. Which, if you consider that there were uh, advanced beings living on an island, they might have had cloaking technology. Yeah. They might have also uh, had interdimensional capability. Maybe High Brazil wasn't even an island, but a craft. So I guess yeah. my question is, have there been any cases of craft or ships disappearing over that area where High Brazil supposedly is in the same way that we have that phenomena in the Bermuda Triangle or even in the American West or uh, uh, Midwest over the Great Lakes? Yes, yeah, great question. Now, I don't know of any ships disappearing or, or anything of that nature, but certainly this whole business of high Brazil is very interesting to us and has resurged itself in our interest over the last few years simply because the last time we were in Ireland, um, we were collecting sacred waters from sacred places. We were imbibing waters with the, the spirit of these places. And uh, let, me, let me drop in a quick little commercial. We're putting up a website soon called sacredearthwaters.com because it's going to have the waters from these sacred places. But we wanted to get water from high Brazil, but lo and behold, it doesn't exist, right? Not on the horizon. But if you look at the ancient maps, and there's much proof of this, if anybody was to do a search online for High Brazil, H-Y-B-R-A-S-I-L, it, it sounds like the Brazil in South America, but I believe there's no connection, but yeah. it's High Brazil. Yeah. And uh, 
that island is actually marked marked on those ancient maps, mm -hmm. but it's not on any modern maps. So it, 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 either the water levels rose or it sank or, or as you say, there's cloaking technology, there's other stuff going on. But we wanted to get water from there. So what, what could we do? Well, what we did was, in our tour of the west of Ireland and visiting all the sacred places along there, we, were, we followed our intuition, very much guided by spirit, and we found this beautiful private cove, a, a, a really perfect little beach on the west coast, the southwest coast, coast in County Kerry, very close actually to, um, very close to, I don't know if your listeners would know of Car Civeen or, or um, uh, the Ring of Kerry. Mm -hmm. Many people would have heard of the Ring yes. of Kerry, yes. Well, down in that area. But we looked to, to see in our mind's eye, could, if we looked out beyond the horizon, could we see uh, high Brazil? And sure enough, we got it energetically it spoke to us and we we invited it into our jar of water this was a most amazing experience we stood there angel rose and i and we actually relived what it was like to be there in those ancient times and i remember swimming underwater breathing like as if i was over water breathing perfectly air underwater i remember flying effortlessly in a human body and various other amazing amazing insights came to us but we we actually imbibed the spirit of high brazil in water that we have with us in the united states oh, today that is phenomenal. <laughs> i knew you i knew you'd love that one yeah, yeah. I if, do. if you were to drink some of that now would would it come back yes yes because what we do is uh we have little you know like people would have fire circles we would have water circles <laughs> Yeah. And we actually sample. We actually sample this water, and it. You know, we people have amazing experiences awesome. from it. Yeah, wow. yeah. In fact, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you another little story. It's another Irish story that you, your listeners will relate to. I know it's going off the topic of High Brazil, but it's to do with Saint Bridget. Now, Saint Bridget, her feast day is the first of February, which in in our part of the world is the first day of spring. Yes. And uh, Saint Bridget is very famous because she. Uh, many, many miracles attributed to her. But she kind of, when Christianity, when St. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland, they kind of superimposed a religious St. Bridget on top of an ancient feminine goddess Bridget that was there, who had all these great powers. And we found her uh, grave site, her grave place where she's buried. We also found her well in County Kildare where she built a, a monastery and did all kinds of amazing things but we've got the water from St. Bridget's grave and we brought it to the United States and just a couple of weeks ago we did a workshop where there was a bunch of people sampling Bridget's water and there was a lady who attended there who was completely and totally mind blown with all this because she identified so much with Bridget that in the last couple of days actually she has come to us countless times her whole demeanor has changed. She's like as if she has blossomed. And, and I mean that. It's like she's like a flower that has just come into full bloom mm. because she imbibed the energy of, of that goddess Bridget. I mean, it's quite, it's quite astounding. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, Bridget is my confirmation name. Hey, and, there you uh, go. I, because I'm born almost, and we almost have the same birthday, February 9th. So, it's, and you, are you the 8th? No, I'm the eleventh. You're the eleventh. I knew you were getting there, yes, but uh, yes, yes, yes. well, I would be very and and would that be would we be journeying to St. Bridget's Well, and that would that be one of the spots on the trip in the in May, next May? Certain is that and a number of others as well, and we will be imbibing those waters in all of the places that we go, and we will also be going into the Akashic Records in various places, finding out what actually went on in the places like Newgrange and, you know, the Hill of the Witches and yes. the Stone Circles and the Megalithic Mounds and, yeah. This oh, my goodness. Time to speak about that, do you think? Uh, for uh, him just to talk about the event. Oh, yes. Uh, next year. Uh, yes, um, Kevin, tell us a little, I mean, Ohanu, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the, kind of the mechanics of how that will work yeah. on, for next year. Will people fly and meet you in, in Dublin yeah. or, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll meet people in Dublin. Do you know, it's only going to be such a small group that I, I don't want to take up your time in terms of, you know, trying to promote it or explaining it too much because what has happened in recent years is, and it's happened all over the world, insurance and all of that has got very, very high. Mm-hmm. And to keep expenses down, we will we only travel with a small group of people. And that way we can travel in one vehicle. We can tell the stories as we're going along from place to place. And it, it would be a much more experiential and beneficial tour for people yes. and uh, so that way you know we're not we don't want hundreds of people you know yeah. um, there are tours where you can go you, you know the Irish Tours Board does fantastic tours but it will not be of the kind that we're talking about mm-hmm. it will not be visiting you know we will be visiting the sacred sites we'll be going into the caves we'll be visiting the the, the sacred mounds the stone circles we'll be visiting the fairy raths mm-hmm. you know and we'll be doing everything we will be we will be crossing that veil that thin veil between the worlds is what we'll be doing oh I can <laughs> Because yeah. things are pretty thick over here. <laughs> <laughs> so when you talk about Atlantis, I believe that they had that knowledge. They had that information. And, you know, you connected two places in our conversation earlier on. You connected uh, the Bermuda Triangle, mm-hmm. and you mentioned in the same sentence almost High Brazil. Mm-hmm. Now, it's my belief, and it is only my belief, my opinion, that they are actually connected by a triangle themselves. Mm-hmm. That if you were to draw a line between the, the Bermuda area down there and connect that to Ireland round about where High Brazil is and bring the other uh, line of the triangle back to Canada into Newfoundland and all that area and then bring it right down to form a triangle like that, I believe that that is Atlantis. Yes. Well, certainly that makes tremendous sense because, of course, that that embraces, uh, you know, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the Marianas Trench and those areas where they feel maybe the big chunk of the continent uh, finally went down. But we have to remember that in all of the Atlantean information that, that has been channeled not only through Edgar Cayce but many, many wonderful channels and historians, that uh, there were a number of yeah. cataclysms. It didn't happen overnight. There were culture bearers that went everywhere. The Hopi, yeah. the Hopi Indians, for goodness sake, are uh, <laughs> they have yeah. um, they have written materials that are ancient Ogham that is not their own right. language. Now, how yes. how could that how could such a thing occur? You know, yeah. it, it, See, this is why this is why I say that to to follow mainstream science or mainstream uh, professional archaeology archaeology is it can only bring you so far. Uh, you know, I think that you do have to look to those ancient peoples to see what it, what it was that they were tuned into. What was it that they understood? And then it begins to open up the possibility that you know we did, we weren't born out of apes at all, that somehow there was some orchestration with creation Mm -hmm. of the human form and some abilities that we had then, obviously had then, that we don't have now. And I think they they do need to be explored. You know, we we do it in lots of different ways with uh, the realization of psychic abilities that people have, mm-hmm. intuitions that we have, synchronicities that we have in our lives. You know, we recognize that there's some abilities we have we can't quite grasp them yeah. yet. You know, we can't bring them down into a into this three D reality, but we know they exist. Mm-hmm. So the more we ground that, the more we're able to heal the bigger parts of ourselves. And, you know, you mentioned about ancestry there a little while ago. I think that in a, in a bigger way, the more we heal these parts of ourselves, we're actually healing backwards in time. Yes. We're healing the ancestry too. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. time is not really linear. Uh, it, no. It, it, no. It, this is a concept that we have agreed upon so That's that right. we can go through various exercises and lessons and 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 experiences, but... It's probably yeah. much more like an onion in that respect. But I totally yeah. agree that we can we can heal interdimensionally. Interdimensionally yeah. we can heal 
the past, Absolutely. the present, the future, all of it being one. I, I, I yeah. completely agree with that. And and I'm sure, Honu, that you and Angel, with all of the work that you do with your your marvelous Honest to God series, your Akashic Records reading, you are, mm. consciousness is raising. Uh, these, oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's raising, and, and mm. these things are... Um, anytime anyone participates in these wonderful types of activities, no matter where they're doing them, uh, their pineal gland is becoming stimulated. Uh, it, yes. It has, been, yes. It, it has been sort of vestigial, you know, and not really used, but it's possible mm. to reactivate mm. it. We do mm. it, I, I work with that, I do that in hypnosis. Mm actually yes. tell it tell it to turn on we yes. have the, we have the control and the power yes. to actually adjust our body chemistry yes we do uh, the the brain angel rose has pointed out many times that the brain is its own pharmacy it's the best pharmacy you'll ever get the best stuff which is yeah. why i i am kind of a little bit cool on this idea of um ayahuasca and having mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. take something that yes radical yeah. to do yeah. what I think can be done gently and naturally but maybe that's just because I took too much acid at university <laughs> and I, I don't want to go there again I don't know but <laughs> yeah. you know it's an interesting subject because you know what I mean the, the world is ravaged by diseases and cancer being one in particular that many many people claim that uh, marijuana is, is, is a cure for, you know, that there's a cure. There's cures for everything in nature. Yes. Nature doesn't put a nettle here without putting the antidote of the dock leaf beside it, you know, yes. always in nature. So, so there are cures, but of course we know, and again, that's another tangent to go off talking about big pharma and all of that. Mm. So, and I'm sure your listeners would be well clued into that whole big story. Yes. Yes. But, but the point is though, that when you talk about ayahuasca, we have asked that question in the Akashic Records several times, actually. And the answer that comes back from, from source is that inside yourself, you have the greatest pharmacy of all. You don't need outside stimulus that puts you out of control in, in several different ways. In fact, some of these substances while they can open up the potential and people can get a, a, an idea and a grasp of a bigger potential, it can crash the template, mm -hmm. the, 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 the DNA template. Mm -hmm. And that, unfortunately, happens to a lot of people. So that's why we don't use any kind of these stimulants at all. And we caution others against it. And if people have done it in the past, it's a wonderful thing because at least there's some idea of the potential that that is out there. You know, time travel, interdimensional travel, mm -hmm. being in two places at the same time, walking through walls, shrinking to the size of an atom. All of these things are well known to the yogis of the East, mm -hmm. you know, without any stimulus whatsoever. Exactly. And not every individual is emotionally stable enough to tolerate a kind of yeah. narcotic experience like That's right. that. And you know what, Leslie, if I may, because yeah. what you're talking about right now, and it seems plain as day, question, mm -hmm. that I want to ask our guests, and it seems plain as day, why do you do what you do? Because this is kind of what oh, we're talking dear. about right now. I know it's a tangent, yeah. but I really am, this was one of my pressing yeah. questions for you. Why do you do what you do? What is the oh, calling? Oh, dear. Right. Now, <laughs> you know something, I'm going <laughs> to... I hate to do this, but I'm going to direct you to a YouTube video that we made just last week. And it's called Why, Why, Why. And if anybody was to search for Ahanu, A-H-O-N-U, you'll see a video that we made, Why, Why, Why. And Wes, it answers that question. Why do we do what we do? Yeah. And you know something? We, it's, a, it's only a 33-minute video. Mm -hmm. But we, we needed to ask and answer that question ourselves because up to that in a, in a way, we were going forward on intuition. We were going forward providing these services and these readings and these, uh, these, these, these waters and looking at the expansion of consciousness mm -hmm. without actually knowing, well, why are we doing this? Well, like, it's not like somebody is giving us, you know, $10,000 $10, a week to, you know. Yes. There's no, nobody paying us anything for what we do. And... Uh, we had to answer that question. Why do we do what we do? And what we found was that it was really a service 
to others. It was really a service that we felt was necessary because we ourselves have gone through so much pain and suffering that you know we we, we learned through adversity. This is what we found that Angel Rose, she her first husband was shot when they were ma- three months married. Mm-hmm. And uh, she started asking questions at that point in time, you know, where, what is death? Where is he gone? Can I communicate with him? And in my case, it was, sorry, shortly after that, well, not shortly, you know, a few years after that, another partner of hers committed suicide. He shot himself in the head right in front of her. Oh, wow. And it was through those shocking experiences, that terrible trauma that came out of it, that she started investigating, yeah, and, and, and in my case, um, my first baby died on my birthday, the 11th of February, you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know whether for years to celebrate my birthday, to be happy on my birthday, to be sad, what to do. Mm-hmm. And, and I wanted to know, why did he die? And, and why did it happen to me, you know? Like, why me? What did I do? You know, I, I'm not a, a drug addict or an alcoholic or a wife eater, you know, so why? And these were real questions. And luckily, what I did was I began to journal all that long time ago. And I wrote down these questions and I wrote down my attempts at the answer, the answers. And as time went on, I found these amazing synchronicities were happening in my life. Amazing things were going on. And when, after 27 years, I put all the dots together, and I, it turned out to be a book, actually. My, my book is called The Reincarnation of Columbus, and that is a true story. It, it's a, an epic voyage, I call it, actually, from the pain and sorrow of a father's grief to a new world of empowerment. And I called it that because I felt empowered by my discoveries from these questions that nobody else was able to answer for me. And, you know, people always find these answers deep within themselves. And this is what we do now. We, we stimulate the questioning mm-hmm. in people. Mm-hmm. We stimulate them seeking the answers themselves. And this is why we actually put together a, a wonderful uh, home study course called Trans- Transformational Writing Effectively. It's journaling your way to a happy life. It's how to find those answers inside yourself. And then we also did uh, have a home study course called Learn to Read the Akashic Records. We teach people how to read that place in spirit inside yourself where you can get your own answers on every level, on every dimension on every plane of existence. Mm -hmm. And these are the gifts I believe those ancient peoples had, those Atlanteans, Mm -hmm. uh, those Lemurians. I think they were on a plane of spirit where they were, had access to universal knowledge, you know? And so so this is what motivates us to answer your question, Wes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we had to arrive at it out of pain and trauma and suffering, you know? But as I said, thankfully, we're in a position now to be able to uh, give this gift to people and stimulate those, that questioning and answering inside themselves. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for answering it that way. Yeah, that yes. is. And, and what, a, what blessed work you're doing. It's, it's, it's just incredible. And, um, you know, speaking of um, your, uh, your book, of course, The Reincarnation of Columbus, and do you feel, Ahonu, that uh, your young infant son... Uh, who passed so tragically, um, has incarnated into the physical world? Wow, what a question. Uh, That's actually why I called the book what I did, The Reincarnation of Columbus. It's a little bit of a story. What happened is when my first wife was pregnant with Ryan, who died, uh, we were doing a lot of traveling at the time. And in all of that traveling, you know, she would place my hand on her pregnant tummy and I could feel him moving around. And I felt he was a great traveler as well. So we called him the great traveler. And then that led on to actually calling him in the unborn state, calling him Columbus. So much so that we would say, oh, what, you know, when's Columbus due? You know, Columbus will be due soon, you know, the great traveler, right? Well, what we didn't know and we only found out several months after he had died, didn't he die? Sorry, he died on my birthday, which was the 11th of February, but he was born on the 
12th of October, which was the day Columbus discovered America 500 years before to the day. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's like they, they, this was one of these coincidences that I talked to you about. So there was some kind of a spiritual lesson in there that we needed to get and to find out what it was. So at that time, in the questioning, you know, in that finding, trying to find out why is he dying, where is he now, and all of that, I went to an Indian guru um, in the, in the uh, Vedic tradition. And at that, at that point, we had uh, two other sons born at that point in time when I went to this um, reader. And he said to me, that son has come to you again. Oh. And, uh, yeah. And I did not tell him, and I have not told anybody except you oh. to this day. Oh. And uh, he said, that son has come to you again. So to answer your question, I do believe he has reincarnated again. Yeah, I believe oh. that too. Mm -hmm. I believe that too. There yeah. was a very similar to your story. There's a very... Um, Oh, famous American uh, television actor named John Schneider. He was in the Dukes of Hazard. He worked quite a lot. He was a very busy guy. And um, his, uh, the eldest brother in his family had passed as an infant, not unlike your son, but maybe at a little bit older, maybe more like at age three, something like that. And okay. when he, John Schneider, came into the world, he had all of these, mem he had memories that didn't make any sense. He would say to his mother, well, remember when I climbed out that window and you got so scared and just things that he shouldn't have known that were never sure. discussed. And yeah. some of it was so profound that yeah. he really, and, and I believe maybe he went to see someone, but he really was the incarnation of his older brother who mm -hmm. passed as an infant. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, yeah. so I yeah. think this is maybe, maybe yeah. it's not even unusual for that to happen. Well, you see, these are the things that, you know, when we spoke earlier about uh, people looking now more to their intuition and their insight. And these are the things that are coming more to people in their awareness these days that they're willing to look at. Whereas, had you mentioned that, that in the 1600s, you'd be burnt at the stake. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I would be. Yeah. In fact, they tried to yeah. burn me at the stake in Los Angeles, but I ran too fast. <laughs> <laughs> Stay in Canada, you'd be safer. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> now, um, Ahanu, have you um, been um, uh, ever... Uh, privy to any um, discoveries of ancient remains in Ireland that reflected a larger um, uh, humanoid type being? Have there been any discoveries like that within mounds or burial spots? I'm sure there have been, but like you mentioned a little while ago, a lot of times these kind of discoveries get whisked away oh, yeah. because they're just they're not able to actually cope with the possibility. Yes. So I don't know of any mainstream discoveries like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't heard. It, but like I, like I mentioned at the outset, there is evidence, though, in the stones. You know, there are footprints. There are giant stones that it's impossible for a man of our size to physically move, you, with, with, whether they had wheels or rollers or levers or, you know, it couldn't be done, couldn't be done. <laughs> You know, and and then there's the stones of Newgrange that they say were brought up the river in a in a rush boat. You know, one of these woven boats. You know, made out of reeds and rushes. It's an impossibility. <laughs> the boat would have sunk. Them. <laughs> but you know, they they ask us to believe this stuff. You know? I know it's quite it, it, it's it's, <laughs> it's laughable. I know it's yeah, even yeah. if you if you go to to Stonehenge and you see their version of how it all happened, it's it's incredibly laughable. They have yeah. illustrations and wrong dates and and yeah. uh, and the whole thing. Luckily, some wonderful people like um, I, uh, Graham Hancock comes to mind yeah. immediately because he's been sure. so instrumental in revisiting the the dating of the Sphinx. Which was yes. is is thousands of years older than than any. Sure. It could be yeah. forty thousand years old. 
and the evidence is there in the water lines at the base of the thing. I mean, you can't argue with that. You know, you can't. You can't at yeah. all. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And um, some of the spots, uh, of course, if, as you mentioned a bit earlier, have huge astrological implications. And I believe is is Newgrange not one of those spots where the where the the sun does appear at a certain point of the year and pierces through and shines into yes. an inner sanctum. Yes, it does. Yeah. Uh, in a nutshell, what it is is on the seven on the twenty first, the the winter solstice, the twenty first of December every year, the sun, the rising sun, on the on the horizon, shines a shaft of light down a twisted passageway down into a central chamber for seventeen minutes, and in that time, it supposedly illuminated the, the spirits of the dead who were buried in there. Mm. Now, this was the story when they classified it as a tomb, but we never believed it was a tomb. Wow. It was too sophisticated to be a tomb. It, 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 you know, why would somebody carry thousands of tons of stone and rock and build a sophisticated model of something on the ground that matches something like the Cygnus constellation in the skies to bury somebody? It didn't make sense. The, the reason they classified it as a tomb was because they found some uh, burnt bones in one of the chambers, and therefore the logical conclusion was, oh, this is a burial chamber. Yeah. But my understanding is, I believe, the reason that the bones were in there, the cremated remains were in there, was because in that 17 minutes when the sun would come down that shaft into uh, that central chamber, the, the spirit of the dead would come out through riding on the shaft of light through the sun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was their way of entering into the other realms. Mm -hmm. This was a way. This was this was their resurrection. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, mm -hmm. okay. indeed. This was their ascension. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's my understanding. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They come and they celebrate, and they dress up. They dress up in the finest of druidic garb. It's a spectacle. It's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Yeah. Well, we all love a good costume. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. love a good yeah. robe. So would you say that the, the druids were, in a sense, maybe the most, and they're ancient, of course, but maybe the most contemporary carriers of the original Irish religion or Celtic religion? Yes, I... I I venture to say so. I would think so. And I would think also that that is one of the reasons why there was such a concerted effort all through the following years to get rid of those kinds of belief systems. Mm -hmm. And of course, Christianity was very effective at doing that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, we, we see in many monuments around Ireland and many Christian monuments around Ireland, uh, effigies of the female form, the naked female form, with the, the wide, wide open legs and uh, vagina representing, representing the divine feminine, representing the womb of creation. Mm -hmm. But Christianity had to incorporate that into their church buildings in order to bring the pagans into the church. Yeah. You know, so there was this merging, there was this amalgamation of beliefs going on. And that was the only way they could do it. Yes. Well, they were always great at marketing. Uh, I don't know that's true. No yeah. greater, well, no well, greater, well, greater marketers than, than the early church. They found yeah. a way to, to, to find something local, to mm. put their stamp on it, and make money at it. That's right. Yeah. You know, even, even down to uh, uh, traditional Irish dance. Uh, you know, they, they took it out of the crossroads, they made it, uh, uh, you know, your arms by your sides, and they put it in the church hall and charged admission. So, <laughs> nobody you're, better. You're cruel. That's not fair. <laughs> nobody <laughs> better. Until our Chicago boy, Michael Flatley, came along and leased and everything up, right? He changed it. He rocked it, didn't he? <laughs> he did, bless his heart. I, it took some, of that, took some of that American chutzpah to uh, return uh, Irish dance to the wonderfully full-figured thing that it is, right? So, yeah, bless his yeah, heart. But uh, yeah. Well, Ahonu, um, 
I think we're just about uh, we're just about to wrap up here. But um, mm-hmm. again, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on our uh, our debut Contact TV, and um, hopefully we'll be in the same location at some point. We do have a studio. Some of our some of our interviews will be done in studio, but of course mm-hmm. that would require uh, people to be in the same uh, city. But uh, all of that's happening. But through the miracle of technology, there you are. And through your own adventurous spirit, there you are in Oregon. And uh, <laughs> tell me, I, how I is am, Anne Gale? Is she? Is she, uh, she? I know she was a bit under the weather. Is she feeling better she now? She was. She was. Yes. No, she's not a hundred percent. And it's hard to put a finger on it. And you, people have been saying that it's chemtrail flu. Hard to decide or, or diagnose, but it's a lingering kind of a flu symptoms that mm. has, she's never experienced before, and many other people have said they've never experienced anything like this before. So we're, we're kind of coming around to thinking that maybe this is one of these man-made things, and uh, gosh, don't get me going because I have first-hand experience of uh, chemists and, and uh, my biologies being involved in the manufacture of these uh, vaccines and stuff mm. that I witnessed, and uh, so there is this possibility. I'm not saying it is, but she's struggling with it. Let me say she is recovering slowly, but boy, it's a tough road. Yeah. And, uh, from a from a medically intuitive standpoint, uh, I think I agree that there is some kind of pollutant issue, some kind of low level poisoning. Lots of good hmm. water needs to be drunk, and yeah. uh, lots of lots of rest. And uh, I'm I'm sure that her immune system is going to just kick that out, and she'll be. She'll be finished yeah, she will. fiddle in no time, and uh, she will. She will. You know, once in once in my my last trip in, to Los Angeles, I saw, I saw chemtrails. I've never seen anything like this, Ahonu. I saw oh, I brown, know. like a dark red brown substance yeah. being yeah. sprayed, uh, dropped over Los yeah. Angeles. Now it couldn't. Somebody said, "Oh, well, that's that's uh, crop dusting." Well. This was Los Angeles. This was, yeah, what? <laughs> this was the urban. I mean, if anything, they were crop dusting. You know, South Central LA. The worst. Maybe they were trying to wipe out. You know, the crime crop areas. Dust, I don't know. But that's people, where it was. Yeah. Yeah. And same thing here in Oregon. I've never seen anything. Like we counted seventeen crisscross trails. You know, crisscross like this. And some of them even sweeping around, curling, that no flight would be taking that mm. flight path, you know? Mm. And then the other thing that puzzles me too, you know, they say, oh, it's just, it's just the, the uh, jet engine. But you, you also see military jets flying in and out of here and flying quite high. You never see any chemtrail from any, from any of those, no contrail or anything from them. Yeah, What's the it. difference? Yeah. What's the difference, you know? So, I, I mean, there are arguments for and against and all of that. But it's just too fishy, way too fishy. And there's people suffering now as a result of it, you know. But anyway, let's not not end on a negative. Um, I I have to say I'm thrilled for you guys. I'm absolutely delighted with what you're doing. And I I feel so privileged and delighted and full of joy to be part of your, your signature unfolding it's fantastic oh, thank you well bless your heart ohonu and folks if you want to reach ohonu directly it's very easy just ahonu a h o n u dot com you can look at his beautiful art you can order his wonderful book the reincarnation of columbus which will be uh, an incredible experience for you and communicate directly and also find out about all the workshops and the akashic record readings that are being done by Ahonu and his uh, lovely twin flame, my friend, and Gail Rose. So do check into ahonu.com. And, uh, and certainly we wish you a wonderful holiday on the first. And uh, maybe start a little bonfire and do a little wee dance <laughs> around it. Maybe we walk the that. dog through the bonfire. <laughs> We would be doing everything to purify ourselves and our kids. We will jump through hoops, jump through fire, whatever it takes. All right. Well, Ahonu, may the road rise up to meet you and may the wind always be at your back. And may you be in heaven a half an hour before the devil knows you're dead. You betcha. (laughs) Thank you so much. Good night from us here at Contact TV. And we'll talk with you very soon, Ahonu. Thank you again. Good night. Good night now.